I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. State government shutdowns and budget extenders, Elliot Spitzer and CNN, the new Democratic Party and the old Republican one, people dying in the streets and the NYPD tapes, better school alternatives and setting kids up to fail, and the 2010 elections and taking out the political trash. Joining me to talk about these and more is Errol Lewis, columnist for the Daily News and a member of its editorial board and a CNN contributor. Errol also hosts a morning radio show on WWRL AM 1600 and writes a column, Commerce and Community for Our Time Press, published twice a month and based in Bedford-Stuyvesant. His blog, SaveBrooklynNow.blogspot.com, tracks the stunning rise in crime in some neighborhoods throughout the city. Welcome back, Errol. Good to see you. How do you do all this multimedia? Print, TV, radio, blogs, you're a one-man media outlet. As I tell my journalism students, um, they're all going to be doing that pretty soon. Um, this convergence is very real. Um, there are a lot of different ways to tell a story, and um, the phrase that's used in the industry is platform agnostic. In other words, the, the story's there, and you grab whatever you got. Maybe it's an audio recorder. Maybe it's a TV camera. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a, a pad and a pen. Uh, but you got to go out and get the story. Synergies among and between these various media, did they bleed into one another in terms of your professional life? Uh, on, on a good day or on a good week, uh, they do. Uh, you prepare for, I, I, do, I do morning drive, so I'm up very early. I get a stack of newspapers and a cup of coffee, and I'm, uh, ideally I'm ready for the day. After talking about issues for three hours and interviewing people and taking phone calls, um, you know, if I have to do TV that night, presumably I've given some thought to the issues that I just spent three hours talking Good. about. Good. Let's start with some headlines. State budget and Albany dysfunction. They just passed an extender, the 11th one. Talk about this legislature, this governor, the state of the state. The, the state is in very bad shape. These are deep, serious structural problems that I'm not sure the, uh, the public really recognizes. There are severe uh, budget crises, and the institutionally, what we've set up to try and deal with budget crisis is not doing it. So we've got a legislature that is supposed to debate and cast votes and make choices, and they're not doing any of those things. There's no debate. Uh, they're not casting any votes, and they're not debating any of these things. So um, we, we've got a, a, a broken-down system, and in, instead of doing the things they're supposed to do, what we're doing are these extender bills, which include severe cuts to really important programs, but those cuts are being made without debate, without public input, without really any pr press notice, to tell you the truth, because you have to kind of dig through the extender to figure out where the cut is, and then you have to do a whole other round of uh, trying to figure out who's on the other end that's going to get hurt, whether it's a nursing home or senior citizen center or some other mostly social service agencies. Yeah, there's virtually no dis virtu First of all, there's virtually no discussion. And second of all, there's no discussion on the human impacts of these. For example, in the most recent extender, there were $325 million in cuts in mental health and human services. It just passes through. Well, that's right. It just happened. I mean, there are cuts to public housing. What's that going to mean? There's cuts to uh, um, uh, people who are mentally ill. There's cuts to addiction treatment programs. What all of this means, who's going to be uh, short of money, who's going to have to close their doors, and what treatments are not going to be delivered to needy populations, all completely unknown. Um, and we'll only be finding it out uh, and, and by the way, there's some plain fraud that's going on here. God, I mean, God, talk about uh, fraud. One of the extenders, not the most recent, but one of the other ones, first of all, there, there, there initially was a number of $200 million that was going to be saved uh, by curbing Medicaid waste, fraud, and abuse. Right. Now, why they never curbed waste, fraud, and abuse up until this year and this extender is unknown. 
the number changed over some period of days from 200 million to 300 million. So 50% increase. They based needed 100 on, million. Based on no empirical facts or change whatsoever. And so uh, we, we are calling this a balanced budget or a, a rocky path to a balanced budget, but it's really not going to be that. It, there are going to be a lot of numbers on a page, and what it all means we're going to have to sort out later. So that, so far they've passed about $80 billion worth of budget, but they've only closed a fraction of this $9.2 billion budget gap, like $1.1 billion. Where did they get the other $8.1 billion, and what are they going to cut that they're not going to discuss? Well, we're going to find out. I'll tell you what they're not going to cut is the $700 to $800 million in so-called member items that the individual legislators give to their favorite uh, pet projects back in their districts. This is an election year. Um, they'll, they'll probably shut down the government before they get, give up the, the member items. Uh, where they get the, the remaining billions from, I can, I can predict, and I kind of hope I'm wrong, but I think we both know that um, they're going to end up borrowing a whole bunch of money. And they may not call it borrowing, because, by the way, they've already talked about reamortizing pension payments. And right. That's a and fancy Tom way. And Tom DiNapoli attacked that proposal, where well, they borrow money from the pension funds so they could pay money into the very same pension funds. Yes. Excuse me. Yes. I mean, these people are creative. I, you know, I'm thinking about trying that with my credit card company. I'm oh, going yeah. to make this month's payment um, by borrowing against the payment I'm going to make you in three years And it now. should count. <laughs> yeah. That's we'll, right. We'll see how far that works. That, that yeah. works. Yeah. So... In the latest one, we had 31 Dems and three Republicans voting it. Now, because you've got this peculiar situation in the Senate where you've got 32 Dems and 30 Republicans. Ruben Diaz from the Bronx votes no, so they need Republicans. These people do it on the basis of an analysis of the public interest, or were they let go by... Dean Skelos, so the government didn't shut down. I, I have a theory, and I have no basis for this whatsoever, but I'm pretty sure that I'm right, that they're going to cycle through that um, three Republicans were selected to cross the aisle and right. vote for the extender. Another three will do right. it next week. Right. And by the end of the process, I suspect that what they're going to try and do is make sure that everybody who wants to be on the record as having... Uh, tried to save the state from a shutdown, will be on record as having cast at least one ah, vote politics. for an extender. I yeah. love it. I yeah. love it. You called in a, in, in a column, Albany, a regular UN of bad behavior. Yes, yes. That was based on, I, I hear oftentimes that, and I hear this all the time, actually, that um, when black and Latino legislators are, uh, are under the gun, they say, oh, they're, well, they're picking on us. They can't stand the idea that people of color are rising, are rising to positions of power. And I wrote that really as a corrective, and I pointed out that, you know, you had Seminario, an Italian guy who's been packed off to prison, and yep. Brian McLaughlin, an Irish guy who's been packed off to prison. Joe Bruno, another Joe Italian. Bruno, another guy Italian. Valella. <laughs> guy Valella, um, you know, uh, you, you've, you've got no shortage of uh, people who have been willing to get in trouble and um, to risk their careers, their reputation, and indeed their freedom. Um, and... The, the reality is not just the press, but everybody in the public has had enough of it. There's too much of it. And uh, anybody who gets picked on, you know, they're big boys and girls. And uh, they, I think they've gone into public service maybe with the wrong impression that everything they do is going to simply be applauded, even if they steal money, even if they don't answer questions that they're supposed to answer, even if they engage in you know, wrongdoing on the level of, 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 of punching somebody out. You know, you've got that, that level of, of misconduct that goes on, too. So um, it, it's a sideshow, frankly. I mean, the important issues are the ones we were just talking right. about. Getting, getting the budget passed, getting uh, the, the, the hearing record clear so that people know what their elected representatives are doing. But scandal sells papers, sells airtime, and attracts eyeballs generally. Are we ever going to get the type of examination from the media that we ought to to inform the citizenry? It's, it's, an, it's an interesting question. It's an interesting question because uh, the scandal, it's not, it doesn't, doesn't just sell newspapers. Um, and from what I hear about the industry, it doesn't sell as many papers as it, it used, used to. Right? But, but, but the, it, it's important that people know. If, uh, if, if your representative has been arrested, for example, you need to know that. Right. And you need to know why and you need to know what the implications of that are. Uh, on the other hand, these larger issues, the, the fact that um, hundreds of millions of dollars are being slashed from programs without uh, a proper hearing record, without proper input from the public or notice to the public, 
Um, it, it's, it's, it's hard, but you know what? It's a challenge. Mm -hmm. And for all of us who are in the media business, it's just a challenge. There are easy stories and there are hard stories. And sometimes a hard story is one that doesn't seem to have uh, a clear uh, a human story mm -hmm. attached to it. Mm -hmm. And your job is to figure out a way to make that palatable, understandable, and maybe a little bit fun to, to digest. And, and in fact, you do that in your columns because you constantly bring it down to the human level. And we'll be looking at examples of that. Shrinking CNN taps Spitzer, reports today's New York Post. Looks like you have a new colleague at CNN. Your reactions? Well, I mean, uh, it, it, it may or may not happen. I can tell you the first part of that is completely wrong, and it's a, it's a very interesting misconception people have now. I am not on the payroll of CNN. I'm a contributor. Right. I show up when they call me. Right. Um, CNN is about to have its most profitable year ever, and people don't recognize that. They've been shrinking in the ratings, and this is what everybody focuses on, mm. particularly their competition. Right. Um, however, CNN as a news organization, you want to talk about synergy, right. they have about 12 uh, stations, about which we know maybe three. Most people know that there's the main CNN, right. there's Headline News, right. and there's CNN International. Right. There are five Spanish language stations. There's a Turkish language station. They've got a special uh, station for Peru. They've got a special station for Argentina. And they're going 24 hours a day. Wow. And they take the same piece of news about, say, the oil, oil spill in the Gulf right. or the latest speech by the president. They slice and dice it. They translate it. They put all kinds of people on it, and they sell it worldwide. And it's a different biz business model than any of their competition. They are fabulously successful. I mean, I went and met with mm. some of their senior people recently and I wanted to give them some condolences and express some concern. And they said, we don't even know what people are talking about. We all just got bonuses, and we're heading for a record year. But in I, I guess the public and the media focus on the competition, for example, with Fox News, and now sure. relatively Fox News is. And, there, and there, believe me, there are a lot of people who every morning wake up and look at the, uh, the Nielsen numbers for the night before, and that's their job, and they're very competitive. But uh, I, I'm told that the um, the uh, the 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 evening hours, the mm -hmm. prime time hours for CNN are about nine percent of their of their business. Right. They're you know nine. So it's small. Yeah. Relatively. Yeah. Yeah. Thank and, you. and and they um, I mean about half their revenue comes not from advertising but from cable subscriptions, right? I mean this is cable news network. That's right. So every time you pay your cable vision or your Time Warner bill. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're taking, taking care, care of. of, they're taking care of with or without ads. Talk about Spitzer. I am one of, I think, a small but growing tribe of people who think that it would probably be better if we found some use for him in public life. And um, I have often compared uh, public servants like him to uh, a plumber or a cook or a carpenter, the people who come to fix your house. The guy who comes and fixes my boiler when he leaves, I don't know if he's faithful to his wife. I don't care. I don't know if he's nice to his kids. I don't care. I don't know if he's a nice guy. I don't know if I want to have dinner with him. I want him to fix the boiler, and then I want him to go home. And Spitzer has shown um, an immense talent for fixing certain things, for thinking through certain things, for coming at them with a certain clarity and uh, creativity and energy that I think would, it is just sadly wasted if we can't figure out a way to, to deal with it. Now. I know I'm in the minority with that. People always go back to the scandal that, that led to his resignation. But I think sooner or later, we're probably going to figure out that it's, it's more useful to have him uh, uh, doing something than sitting around hosting a show on cable. What, what skill does he have as the plumber or the electrician that adds to the public discussion? He is a, a top-notch lawyer. And I can tell you this from having covered a lot of his press conferences. Um, he reads the documents. He sits around and he strategizes. This is when he was attorney general. Mm -hmm. He would strategize with his legal team. Um, they, they did certain things, especially with the Martin Act. That's the one everybody right. kind of knows about. They took a fairly obscure New York law. They uh, examined its potential, and they really used it to, to do certain things. Mm -hmm. another, another point of law where he ran up against the Bush administration and lost, but history has shown him to have been right, was over the, the issue of using subpoenas and inquiries to find out what was going on in the subprime yep. uh, lending market. He was forcefully blocked. It went all the way to the Supreme Court. But he led a group of attorneys general or from around the nation in trying to push for the right of states to inquire what was going on with the banks that operate within their borders. And had he not been frustrated in that attempt, 
we seriously might have uh, at least um, truncated, if not stopped in its tracks, the, the subprime lending crisis that, that burnt down the whole economy. I mean, what, what more evidence do you need that this guy w was early, was right, and um, might be early and right about some other things if we would only give, put him in the right position to find out for us. Okay, you did a column on April 15, 2010, called The Spitzer Legacy, which really talks about lost opportunities. Talk about those lost opportunities. Huge lost opportunities. Um, he had begun a process of prison reform, which thankfully his successor, right. David Patterson, continued, but um, we, only, we only touched the tip of it. He could have done a lot more. Um, there was a lot more to be done. He held a press conference in Albany that I had attended where they talked about reconceptualizing the state university system, which is one of the... And, and CUNY as well. Sure. And, and, and it's, it's still something that's just out there that's just elusive. I mean, more so with the state system than, right. with, than yes. with CUNY. Yes. The legislature just plays with it. Like, they have this insane mandate that everybody pay the same tuition on every campus, everywhere in the state. Crazy. Which prevents us from developing what they have in California, where you have some schools like Berkeley that are really top tier right. schools right. and um, offer different kinds. So we haven't been able to differentiate and uh, allow different campuses to, to develop. And we haven't put enough money into the system, clearly, in terms of, I mean, here I am preaching full-time faculty, et cetera. <laughs> so in a sense, we're, again, being extraordinarily short-sighted. And as soon as Spitzer left, that whole thing just evaporated. That's right. That's right. And then the, another one of his big things was on um, trying to bring down the cost of, of power, electricity right. and so forth. And uh, it is one of the key reasons that businesses continue to leave the state and take jobs with them. And um, the, the only thing you're going to find when people ask about Spitzer is the 18 months of fighting with the legislature right. followed by the hooker scandal. Right. And all of these other really important initiatives are uh, sitting on the shelf. Don't you feel like choking them? You know, I saw him the other day, and I didn't feel like choking him. You didn't? <laughs> but, but uh, uh, I, I, well, look, I felt like hiring him, frankly. I mean, here again, I, I think that we've got to find something for this guy to do, or somebody like him, you know? Okay. I mean, he's, he's got a pretty deep bench of uh, talented alumni of his office mm -hmm. who also, I think, ought to be in, uh, uh, in public service. But a lot of them were scattered to the four winds as sure. well. Because sure. if you were anywhere near the guy who left in a scandal, nobody wants anything to do with you. Very short-sighted. In the recent Democratic State Party convention, the, the mantra was the new Democratic Party. You don't think much of this new Democratic Party. Well, I'll tell you, you when, I, when I got there for the convention, I did, because I, I got there and I saw these signs saying, new Democrats, new Democrats. And I said, oh, the new Democrats are here. They're going to save us. And then I found out it was, you know, kind of a... What is it? Kind of a trick. It's the Democratic Party trying to rebrand itself by simply sticking the word new in front. In front of so everything. So there ain't no there there? <laughs> this is, you no, know, no, I don't even, Stein's I'm not even Oakland? Sure, I'm not even sure the signs were new, Doug. I mean, uh, the only thing I can tell you is that the, the signs did not have the union bug on it, so they were printed in non-union shops. So that's what we know so far about the New Democratic Party. It's the kind of party that will use non-union printers to make up their material. And you described them as timid and bitter. You know, the headline writer used that word. Oh, I, I'm I, don't, sorry. I don't know if I would have put bitter in there, but there, there was a fair amount of um, concern. There were some people who were disgruntled. There were some people who take seriously things like not using union printers, right. who don't like union bashing, who don't like some of the other uh, things that were the focus of that convention. Andrew right. Cuomo has set out a path for, um, for the state and for his incipient administration should he become elected mm -hmm. um, that are very much at odds with what his father did, with mm -hmm. what Democrats have done for a long, long time. And there are a lot of people who see the handwriting on the wall. And watching his acceptance speech, there were a number of people who literally sat on their hands rather than stand up and applaud. So he's, um, he's not going to simply waltz in and have the whole party behind him. So the, I mean, they... Governing New York State ain't going to be that much easier on January 1st, 2010, than it has been up to December 31st, 2010. Oh, no, no. Should he win? Well, actually, it's going to be a lot harder. For one thing, the, um, the, the budget is going to increase. Uh, the budget deficit is going mm -hmm. to increase. And that's almost certain. That's almost guaranteed. And you're going to have um, this contentiousness, depending on what the final lay of the land is, whether or not the Republicans get control of the Senate back. There are going to be a lot of Democrats who are used to doing business in a way fundamentally different um, than what Andrew Cuomo has said is going to be the way of the future.
So th in some ways, this, this is a very turbulent and perhaps revolutionary time. Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's kind of a revolution by necessity, though. I mean, we really have played out the budget string as far as it could go. And this sh all of these things should have been talked about and dealt with a long time ago. They weren't. Now they're going to get dealt with, whether anybody wants to or not. And so um, just as we've been forced to the limit and we're doing these budget extenders to prevent the, the, the state from shutting down, uh, going into the next year, it's going to be something similar. We're going to either change or uh, the whole system is going to ground to a halt. Uh, okay. Now, you look at the ticket, the Democratic ticket, for example. You've got Andrew Cuomo. You've got Duffy. You've got DiNapoli. You've got Schumer. You've got Gillibrand. There's been a real question about the diversity, quote, unquote, of that ticket. Is there a problem with lack of uh, racial and ethnic diversity not having it? I, th I, think there's, um, I think there's a strength to diversity that needs to be recognized and respected. But it depends on how you look at it. You know, if l let's say the Democrats um, remain in control of the state Senate, um, and the Democrats will almost certainly stay in control of the Assembly. Well, it looks a little bit different if you take into account that two other state leaders include uh, Sheldon Silver, uh, so now you've got a, a Jewish guy on the ticket, so to speak, mm -hmm. and John Sampson, a black guy out of Brooklyn of Caribbean heritage, who's also one of the major players in the state. So now it doesn't look quite so unbalanced. Maybe now it looks a little bit different. I mean, I, I'm more concerned, frankly, about um, the, the policies with their ability to get mm -hmm. along with their ability to create a governing coalition. And that, that might be where there's a diversity issue. You, you, you can't govern 19 million people with a handful of your friends. Mm -hmm. I think we, we established that with uh, the 18 months of the Spitzer administration. You can't do it that way. You've got to bring people in. And if they're not bringing people in, there's going to be a problem. Um, who the you know the ethnic background if you want to do the the, the tribal count right it, maybe it's an indicator of of, a, of an underlying problem the underlying problem though is what needs to get addressed but New York State politics and New York City politics is still at root tribal politics absolutely absolutely well although I mean I think we're I think we're evolving a little bit away from that I got to be honest with you I mean. You know, if you look at the poll numbers and if you look at who was supporting or not supporting David Patterson when he ran into his, his political uh, problems, mm -hmm. there were a number of black leaders, and I don't want to call their names because they didn't want to go, they weren't ready to go public just yet, but there were a lot of people who were ready to toss him overboard. And um, that was not um, what you would expect based on a pure tribal politics analysis. Okay. Last Sunday's column, Attack on Parties is Un-American, looking at Proposition 14 in California, which sets up this top two system. Talk about what this voting system in, in fact represents. The, the, the top two uh, voting system in, in California, which is they, they hope will be replicated around the country. There's only two states now, Washington State and California. And there's California. discussion of, of it in New York, New York City. The idea is basically to abolish party primaries and make it so that everybody runs together in one initial primary round, and then regardless of party, the top two finishers meet in a general election. California's initiative also bans write-in votes. Mm -hmm. So it's actually taking choice away from people. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I worry about is something that we've seen in a number of elections. If you think about the elections in Illinois um, before Barack Obama became a U.S. senator, where scandals broke <laughs> out between the primary and the general. Absolutely. Well, what happens if you've got uh, uh, this top two system and then all of a sudden between the primary and the general some horrible scandal breaks out? It also... Um, uh, takes out the role of, of third parties, which I think are valuable. They're definitely valuable in New York. They're, um, I, I'm not sure exactly how they work in California, but it's nice to think that there'll always be, um, in a general election, a choice for a green candidate, a right-to-life mm -hmm. candidate, a conservative party candidate, a liberal or working families party candidate. I think that's good. I think that's healthy. I, you know, It's not quite parliamentary democracy, but it allows people to put certain ideas and certain initiatives um, out for public consumption during an election season, top two system would essentially eliminate that. 
Yeah, and also it seems to me that the system is both based on some faulty math and you describe it as elitist contempt. Elitist contempt. I mean, look, the, the, here's the scenario in California, and, and it's, it's not if, it's when. Sooner or later this is going to happen. There'll be a strongly Republican or strongly, let's, let's take a, a Republican district, strongly Republican district. Uh, nine people will run, seven of them will be Republicans because it's a Republican district, but there'll only be two Democrats and maybe they throw their hat in the ring. It's possible that those two Democrats could get the top two. Right. Uh, they they can get the top two finishers while the Republicans split up the vote. And, and represent the, a, a, an insignificant portion of the electorate. And the majority ends up getting exactly what they did not want. And um, it, it also, frankly, it, it is contemptuous of the party system. And, you know, political parties were invented by the likes of Jefferson and Madison. And I think they've stood us in pretty good stead up until now. And people have a constitutional right to free association. I mean, the Democratic Party started out as a caucus to pass the Bill of Rights, for God's sake. You know, we want to we do away with that now? I, I, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So... I'm hoping that this will get um, some pushback by regular people. I mean, when party officials say, we don't like this idea of doing away with party primaries, well, they're very self-interested. Ordinary folk, though, I think, should start to recognize that this is something of an assault on democracy. But how are regular people going to know about this if the media, I'm, I'm going back to you and your colleagues, don't expose the elements of the proposal and its possible impacts? Well, generally speaking, I think the world would be a better place if everybody read my column and did what I told them to do. And <laughs> listen to the radio show. Come on. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, but uh, uh, short of that, and I haven't been able to make that happen just yet, um, although I have plans, the, there, there, there's a... Um, there's a, a habit that I think the media has um, uh, in these uh, tough times of getting rid of all of the old guys, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so a lot of history will walk out of a newsroom one sure. day. A century's worth of, of knowledge will just walk out the door. And you've got young people whose ideas about politics are very different, uh, are maybe based on a consumer model. They never saw the likes of Mario Cuomo in his heyday. Mm -hmm. They never saw the likes of, uh, of the Kennedys. Um, or even the people who came right behind the Kennedys. And so uh, it's hard to imagine how this story is going to get told. Okay. Many thanks to Errol Lewis, journalist extraordinaire, for being my guest today. He will be joining us again next week to continue this discussion on politics, New York City, New York State, and nationally. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email, whatever it is. Thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it, send it.